And welcome to the Missions Podcast, the show that explores your hard questions on missions, theology, and practice to help goers think and thinkers go. I'm Alex Kochman, Director of Media and Communications at ABWE, joined by Scott Dunford, co-host here. And Scott, actually, you know what? Let's try a new introduction for the show today, okay? I've been practicing this. Tell me what you think of this. You ready? Tell me if you're ready. I'm ready. All right. Without any further ado. Welcome to the Missions Podcast, your daily analysis of news and events from a Christian worldview. If anyone knows kind of where, that's good. We got it? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. We We nailed it. Well, if you're familiar with the briefing with Albert Moeller, you instantly recognize that we are not a current events show, folks know. However, we are weekly, we are episodic, and we do need to dive into things that are happening in the world because we are believers in a God whose heart is for all of the nations and peoples of the world, Scott. And I know we've had conversations on the show before about what it means to be a world yeah. Christian, somebody who's often praying for the nations, reading the current events and thinking through the lens of mission and uh-huh. of, okay, how is God going to bring all of these nations under the feet of Jesus, right? We've had conversations like that before. We've never actually done it live on the air in practice though, have we? No, we haven't. We've talked a lot about doing it. We've talked about even doing a a daily news and missions events, but we've never really just looked through the news and said, hey, what's happening around the world? I was just with a group of believers last week, and I I won't name names or names of ministries because of security concerns, but a lot of individuals involved with reaching uh, Chinese individuals for Christ. And what was interesting is, of course, these are some of the godliest people. Uh, Many of them come from underground church situations in China And you really realize that it's like the book of Hebrews says, these are those of whom the world is not worthy. But one of the things that I was struck by in conversing with them is they are all acutely aware of how current events affect their ministry. They all know that they might immediately lose all of their ministry contacts if one wrong move happens on the geopolitical scene and relations between the two nations devolve even further from uh, the the extent to which they're already at odds, the U.S. and China. And so there was this palpable heaviness in the air because, yes, we're here as missionaries. Yes, we're here to make disciples. But we also realize that sometimes missionary activities in the world are at the mercy of governments, at the mercy of current tensions and strife in the world, of prevailing opinions and cultural trends. And it's on us as missions-minded Christians to approach these things from a biblical worldview. Well, and not only that, but, you know, we, we I, I sometimes get phone calls. There's a, maybe be an earthquake in Southern California 10 hours from where I live, and I'll get a phone call from my worried family going, hey, what's going on? I heard in California you had this huge earthquake, and it's like, well, it wasn't any, anywhere near me. But I do tend to pay a lot closer attention to things that are in my neck of the woods and that affect me uh, versus what's happening in other parts of the world. And so... For our missionaries, what's happening in their backyard, even if it doesn't necessarily, like, you know, the story you just shared, like maybe affect their ability to minister, it certainly gives us an insight into what's happening on a daily basis that could be very different and it causes us to stop and just want to analyze and say, what's happening there? Why as Christians should we care? And as we prepare to be missionaries, we think and pray for these parts of the world. How do we pray effectively and intelligently and even understanding the spiritual warfare has taken place as many of these countries are under the domination of of false gods. Yeah, yeah that's right. The, these false gods are competing over the nations and the one true God is taking them back. Now, Scott, when I think about what's happening on a global scene, though, I think about all the things that our mainstream press really wants to bring to our attention, wants us to be thinking about Ukraine and Russia all the time, for instance. And that's a significant thing that's happening, no doubt. But of course, every time you're reporting on something, you're also making some kind of a statement about what's maybe not newsworthy. And in reality, there's a lot of things happening that don't get reported on. And you've gone through, you've pulled out, what, three or four news stories in particular that probably didn't come up in your feed this morning uh, unless you had to go hunting for them specifically. And yet I I think there's some important missions components here. Well, certainly they were on major news sites. I think that's a good place to go. But you have to dig a little bit. If you want to get to world news, you can't just go to the front page. The front page is going to talk about politics, going to talk about things that are affecting the economy, and certainly whatever the hot news story, like obviously Ukraine and Russia has been top of mind for quite a long time because it affects us in significant ways. But 
There are things that are happening around the world, particularly in Africa and Asia and South America, that are a little bit uh, deeper dives, but still, have, I think, have very relevant discussions for missions. So I'm going to pitch a couple articles to you, Alex, and I want to get your your hot take, and then we can kind of go back and forth about that. How does that sound? Uh, man, I'm always down for a hot take. I, I know you are, so let's yep. do it. So the, the first article that I found, I thought was just heart-wrenching and sad, but also kind of gets into some of what our missionaries are dealing with around the world, as well as what the church is dealing with in these parts of the world that actually I think have some relevance to here as well. But this one comes from Kenya. Kenyan authorities on Thursday arrested another prominent televangelist to face criminal charges related to mass killing of his followers. Interior Minister Kithuri Kinkindi said Ezekiel, I don't want to butcher these names, although I already am, Ezekiel Ambak Odero, who pastors the New Life Prayer Church, announced the arrest on Twitter but did not give further detail on the allegations against Odero. And what happened is they found a mass grave with over 100 people buried, some of them buried alive, that were members of this church. And they were people that were dedicated to prayer. Uh, they had followed this pastor, the so-called pastor in this, in this uh, fasting, and it led to them actually dying. And rather than deal with the consequences of it, this guy buried them. Mm. Horrific story. And when you hear a story like that, and based on conversations we've had and interviews we've done, even in the past, dealing with African, African tribal religion, the syncretism of, of some of these things and Christianity. Um, how does that story strike you? How, how should we as Christians read a story like that as we're Christians? It, is, it brings shame to the name of Christ to read a story of this mass uh, burial of really what amounts to, I would say, murder under the name of Christianity. Yeah, it certainly brings to mind the comment from the Old Testament that's quoted in Romans chapter 2, that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles or among the nations on account of you, the you there being religious hypocrites. We know that this hurts witness whenever these things happen. We also have to connect that with the specific situations of missionaries on the ground in these countries. Not only does it give people a, a bad taste in their mouths with respect to the gospel, uh, but that turns governmental and cultural opinion as well. And uh, enough of those experiences, sometimes those things are what lead to policies that are restrictive towards Christians, uh, restrictive towards missionaries or towards open gatherings of churches. We know that the world persecutes believers because ultimately they don't know our Lord. But sometimes there are also proximate causes for persecution that have to do with misunderstandings and with with just negative circumstances in, in the background context uh, that have led to Christianity itself falling out of favor. That's, that's why it's important for, for Christians to, to not only denounce these sorts of things that happen, uh, but to be at a local level practicing church discipline and, and teaching what it means to, to be a true convert, a true local church, a true follower of Christ, so that for all of our people, we're modeling the type of Christianity that that maintains as much as it is possible for us, which it's not always possible, but that as much as possible maintains a, a favorable posture towards a watching world. You know, one of the things I talked about in the article was uh, Odero touts miracle healing for the sick, whom he sells packaged water. He calls it living water and handkerchiefs yeah. at 100 Kenyan shillings. So he's selling these things and, and he's, he's, you know, quoting acts and how, you know, people were healed by things Paul prayed over. And yet we see this, this money-making mechanism connected to the church. And I was just thinking about that yeah. in relation to Paul and how Paul, you know, oftentimes, I mean, in, uh, in, in First Timothy, he talks about it and the rest of the epistles, specifically in First Corinthians, he's dealing with this a lot where he's, he's pushing away these underhanded means. Because I think in these pagan contexts, in which you have a strong, uh, you know, pagan undercurrent where Relationship with God is transactional. You give money to the priests, they give you some kind of a blessing. And then Christianity comes in on top of that. And you've got this opportunity for unscrupulous and, and really devious, wicked Christian leaders, so-called Christian leaders to come on top of that and really fleece the sheep. And I, I think we have to be really careful about that. And I wonder, Alex, here's a question for you as we come in as missionaries, you know, obviously coming from the West, and sometimes we have a lot more resources and means. 
In what ways, I wonder, should we be more like the Apostle Paul in some of these situations and recognizing, hey, here's a pagan context in which financial gain and priesthood is seems to be tied very closely together. And maybe as pastors in these scenarios, we need to go the extra mile to distance ourselves from anything that would smack of getting wealthy on the backs of people. I wonder what your response would be to that. Yeah, I, I mean, we talk about contextualization all the time, and that can go too far. But really, contextualization is is also anticipating the ways that you'll be misunderstood. Uh. And these sort of shamanistic, profiteering, pagan religious practices are as old as as paganism itself. And wherever Christianity goes, and there's not a sufficient or or, or thorough enough discipleship of people into the truth is an opportunity for these things to get mixed together, an opportunity for syncretism. Uh, we have to be aware of that. We've, we've got to be careful. I think for many American Christians, it's an important reminder that the prosperity heresy is not just an American problem. We've exported it all over the world, and it's indigenous to some parts of the world as well. It, it naturally tends to latch on to these tribal forms of relating to God, where God is another spirit that needs to be appeased. And somewhere along the way, the priest or the shaman or the witch doctor, whoever that is, that intermediary figure is lining his pockets because of that. I think not only of how Paul is very careful and sometimes is misunderstood. I think of in Acts 14, him and Barnabas shouting that there were not gods, right? They were recognized as Zeus and Hermes, and they could scarcely restrain the people from sacrificing to them. There's sometimes where the gospel is simply misunderstood because it falls on rocky or resistant soil. But I also think of what the apostle Jude says in the beginning of the book of Jude. Hey, I wanted to write to you concerning the salvation that we have in common, but, and he goes on to denounce false teachers within the church as well. So if your desire is, I really just want to keep the main thing, the main thing, and focus on these beautiful gospel truths, now that's a glorious thing. And, and there are times and places for that. Missionaries don't have the luxury of doing that. Frankly, Americans here in the States don't have the luxury of doing that. We've got to wrestle with the challenges that our culture and context are, are bringing our direction. And missionaries as well are called to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Yeah. And as much as, you know, some of us, people like me who grew up in fighting fundamentalism, want to react to that kind of separatism and kind of be wary of it. We see the need here in this situation, not to just always be just ignoring these kind of major differences. I mean, this is a major right. difference. It has a, yeah, sometimes you got to throw down massive impact, right? It's causing a major problem. And We've got to be able to call out the Creflo dollars and the, you know, I, I can't think of all the names of these guys who I know um, are getting Im exported all around the world and they're seeing these big bucks and they want to just go ahead and make money off it too. So what's your second story, Scott? So hold on, let me just turn my, my camera on again here, my little light. I'm uh, down in the basement of my granddaughter's house. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm, you know, I, I became a grandpa this week and so I'm not in my normal studio, so everything is a little bit hodgepodge here. But thanks for understanding that, that. That is the second news story is that Scott See, that, is now a grandfather. We should have led with only, that instead of my lame yes, Albert Moeller impression. Yes. Mary Joanne Carroll was born this week, and uh, she is so cute and so perfect. And um, I'm very, very excited about that. Mary um, Joanne Carroll. So, so two names wasn't enough. We need three, huh? Well, Carroll's her last name. Oh, Carol's the last name, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, that's yeah. Not, a, that's ambiguous. Yes. That's yes. a last name. I that's we're a pushing first name. for Mary Christmas Carol, but um, Mary is her one grandmother, <sighs> and Joanne is her great grandmother. I I know we had it there. I was right. We, we might still just sneak it in at Christmas time. If um, you're if you're a listener and you agree that Scott's granddaughter should be named Mary Christmas Carol, go ahead and email Haley. <laughs> Yeah. No, just make a Haley donation. Carol. Make it. Just go ahead and make a donation. Yes. That's right. Yes. Leave us a positive yes. rating and a donation, and we will be sure to put your comment in the front of the line. Very That's good. Right. What's That's your right. third news story, Scott? My third news story. So we dealt with the Christian world. I want to go across to the Indian subcontinent, and uh, okay. kind of a, a problem of a completely different kind. Uh, so this is one uh, also from uh, Reuters. India court acquits 69 Hindus of murder of ele the murder of 11 Muslims during 2002 uh, two riots. And it's talking ab about how this 
there's been a massive change in India's government. I'm not sure if everyone understands that or knows a lot about that. But the new prime minister of India is not new. He's been he's been in in his uh, prime minister Modi. He's been there for quite a long time now. But it was a, a massive shift away from kind of a secular government to a very Hindu nationalist government, and uh, the results of that have been very difficult for Christians and Muslims and Sikhs and other non-Hindu religion um, people. But here was the, there was riots that were taking place amongst Hindus, and there were reprisals toward that. And a total of 86 Hindus were accused of the killings in the Narodagam district of Ahmedabad, 17 of whom died during trial, and all the accused were freed on bail. Um, it also goes on to talk about another, over a thousand people, mostly Muslims, were killed uh, across Gujarat province in the 2002 riots. It also goes on to talk about these, there was a mass uh, rape that was taking place and they were, these 11 guys were convicted but then later allowed out and had their sentences commuted. And so you have this problem, a real problem of justice in this country where you have a Hindu nationalist government. The question, you know, I would pose to us, Alice, as we try to think about this, one, I mean, certainly we want to pray for our brothers and sisters as well as other minority peoples in a place like India. I live in little India in uh and in, in the Bay Area, lots of Indians that live there and they're wonderful friends, wonderful people. Uh, but here we have a government that's controlled by a religious ideology. And so what do you say to that? When we have a religious ideology that's other than Christ, what right. should we expect when it comes to justice? Right. This strikes me on multiple levels. And just yesterday, I heard the testimony of an Indian pastor who, in his upbringing, uh, he's now middle-aged, he's involved in leading a Bible college, a seminary, doing all sorts of fruitful ministry, but early in his life, his grandfather, who was a believer, found himself the subject of resistance from his peers, from individuals in his community. But because of his age and because of the respect given to the elderly, he wasn't physically retaliated against. But then he described how, I believe this pastor was maybe eight or nine years old at the time, how he was found by some fellows in their town and was almost stabbed to death and he escaped uh, in the nick of time, after waking up, after being incapacitated, uh, passing out after being struck, and the Lord preserved his life, but because they knew he was the grandchild of this particular Indian believer, he was targeted. And again, yeah. this was decades ago. This doesn't even describe the situation now. The persecution has amplified. People also need to know that India has surpassed China as the world's most populous country. So when we're talking about where uh, simply, are there the, the most people and the most activity happening? We, we have to look to India and realize this is a place of incredible influence and continually so as the other countries of the world, global superpowers, their populations decline. Uh -huh. And so I think it's important for us as, as just kind of a, a vignette of the persecution that's happening now. It's also a recognition that as Christians, we believe in sovereign nations we believe that God loves the nations, that, that nations are real things, that, that those things matter, that nations can be distinct, but that they also need to be under the lordship of Christ because a sort of nationalism apart from Christian influence, especially under the influence of a, a religion with violent tendencies, is not a blessing to a people, right? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. There was an important article just released a few days ago online, and it was in the print edition of the latest edition of First Things magazine, uh, if you're familiar with First Things. And it's by Matthew Schmitz on the, the topic of hazards of nationalism. He goes to a different part of the world. He goes to Israel and describes the, the strong Zionistic Jewish nationalism that's happening there that's also leading to significant persecution, including towards Christians. Uh -huh. And uh, we, we know of individuals who are involved in Israel and are seeing the same things there. And so as much as, yes, we want to push against sort of the globalizing, homogenizing forces in our day and recognize, no, there's an importance to the distinctiveness of nations that apart from Christ and his law and gospel influencing the thinking of a culture, that sort of doubling down on, hey, this is our identity and we're, we're going to lean all the way into our 
uh, for instance, with with this Gujarat story, we're going to lean all the way into our, our Hinduism and we're going to resist anything else violently, that that bears negative fruit. And we've got to recognize that when we preach the gospel across land and sea, we're proclaiming Christ as Lord over these nations. Yes, you're Indian, but you can be Indian and be in Christ and not just be Indian and cling to Hinduism as core to your identity. What's core is Christ and who he made you to be. Uh, but that piece of your culture, man, that has to bow to the feet of Jesus. You know, I was thinking as you were we were talking about, we're both Baptists and um, growing up, going to Baptist college, we had lots of talks about, you know, our heritage as Baptists. And it wasn't that long ago in America that we're Baptists were thrown in prison and often uh, hunted down and, and targeted in a Christian quote unquote nation. And it brings that kind of that question is, as we see the gospel spread and we see Christian justice take place, you know, really being careful as we, as we try to understand, like, how, how, how should justice be meted out? And in the sense of, like, the blindness of justice and the right and wrongness of actions, rather than just in, in this situation, hey, here's some people that have the same religious beliefs as we do. We're going to overlook their wickedness. And so, so we can punt, you know, so we can you know, uh, give favoritism to someone who maybe shares the same creed as we do. And and really biblical justice, um, the things that we are striving for, really seeks to honor what's right, not just honor, hey, we have the same family ties or we stay, go to the same temple. Well, yeah, Scott, I think that, that the average sort of secular religious nun, not N-U-N, but N-O-N-E, right? Uh-huh. Uh, the the N O N E nuns who might read a story like this about Indians persecuting Muslim minorities, I don't know that 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 average secularist postmodern in the U S. even has the categories to 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 see how that could happen because we tend to take for granted so much these principles okay. of freedom of conscience, freedom of expression liberty that that are derivative from a Christian worldview. It's uh-huh. not because of any sort of Western democratic ideal. It's because of Christianity. Uh, pluralism is a fruit of that. The, the idea yeah. that Hindus and Muslims could coexist under the lordship of Christ in an environment where we're trying to win as many of them as possible, but we also recognize that God has allowed the nations to exist in sort of that Acts 17 sense that he gives them everything that they need and they're, they're allowed to exist. Right. And God calls them all to repent, but for now they exist. The day of judgment hasn't come yet. It's, it's the Christian worldview really alone that gives you the, the possibility to, to peacefully agree to disagree. And, and in many ways, and, a Baptist have, worldview, the individual soul liberty, which is something that really Baptists fought for and tried to emphasize because yeah, they, they wanted to make sure that you, there was a, I mean, it's not only Baptists that argue for this. Hyper talks a lot about pluralism in a way that a Christian can understand. The idea of allowing there to be, yes, you need to you need to obey God, but you're going to have to do it. You know, it's your responsibility to do it. There's a sense of pluralism that even can exist within a Christian framework. So the encouragement to the missionary would be: there is no such thing as neutrality. That as you go right. out into these other contexts. There is not the assumption that, hey, we have a neutral public square. We really don't have that assumption anymore here in the U.S. We used to have that assumption. We can no longer assume such a thing as a neutral public square because the secular powers that be have made it very clear it's Christ or chaos here. But that's true globally, and that's always been true. And so recognize that as you go at, into this, this hostile territory that's under the dominion of foreign gods, of false gods, that they want to claim their territory. And yes, even the marketplace, even the open public forum, those false gods will attempt to lay claim to that territory as well. And Uh what you think you're doing by going to the marketplace to share your faith, to have conversations over coffee, to do the sorts of things that seem very reasonable to us because we live in a world of conversation and exchange of ideas and well, isn't that what freedom of conscience is for? And that's why we have coffee shops is to get to know people and, and to have conversations. But those sorts of things can't be taken for granted. Even the most innocuous missionary activity is a declaration of war against the powers of darkness and recognizing there is no neutrality, but we come bearing the light of Christ. Yeah, absolutely. Scott, what else do you have? Well, I, I want to just make one more comment about that. And that would be, you know, it's one thing in our country where we're citizens, we have a right to speak into these things, we have an input into right. our laws and the in, input into it puts it's a very different scenario than what Paul maybe is talking about 
where he's in a very much a minority as a missionary in those places in which it's dominated by evil and dominated by injustice. And in those situations, it's really interesting that Paul's response is, you know, I'm fulfilling the sufferings of Jesus, filling up what's lacking in the sufferings of Jesus towards you. But I think it's a good reminder as we go into these places, on one level, maybe when we're talking to a Muslim in that situation, if we're in India, for instance, maybe you're saying, hey, you know, we look to a better justice that only can come through Christ and what he calls us to. But if we're dealing with the Hindu majority that we're living in, there's an element that we need to understand that we're bearing up under suffering. It's one thing, we, you know, there's an old missionary tract, have we no rights? And as Christians, we come into those situations saying, we don't have rights. We are coming in as lambs to the slaughter. We are coming in understanding there is going to be persecution. Yeah. If they did not treat our Lord differently, why would we expect to be treated, you know, differently than our own Lord and Savior was treated? That's a whole different mindset that it's really hard for Americans who are used to justice to be meted out in a certain way, that you expect the authorities to do what's right. You expect the law to be um, impartial. Let me just come in with two comments there, Scott, as well. One is, you're right, Paul's situation is not the same as ours. Uh, he, He was a persecuted minority under a pagan system. Granted, a pagan Roman system that, that had a lot of good things about it. There was some good legal principles, procedural law that was in place that allowed him to, for instance, appeal to Caesar. And he was a citizen, uh-huh. but the early church were not all citizens, right? Uh-huh. This is different from our situation today, especially throughout the West, where we have political power and we, we have to steward that. We can't cast that by the wayside. We have to recognize, yes, if God's called us to suffer, we do so gladly. But we also can't throw away our influence that we have that early believers did not. That's the one thing. Uh, the other important thing to keep in mind is that there's an apologetic element to the things happening in India here as well. And here's what I mean. Hinduism as this religious system puts itself forward as there's there's all of these different gods, all of these different ways to the this one sort of transcendent uh, divine reality. But fine, you want to worship your Jesus, we'll add him to the pantheon, right? Uh-huh. And it's presenting itself in this very sort of open-handed way, at least, at least the way these ideas trickle into the West. You've worked right. more directly with Hinduism, but, but that's the impression that's given. And yet, that's the party that's that's being violent and closed handed towards any new ideas. Whereas Christians, if anyone you would think would be persecuting others and and narrow, it might be people who think, hey, there's only one way to one God. Right. And every other way is a false way. And yet it's that one true religion and that exclusivity of Christ, those who hold that doctrine, who are willing to say, no, we'll coexist. We'll live life alongside of you. We just want the freedom to tell you about it. Right. <laughs> Right. And and it shows that that these aren't just intellectual things, that there's light and darkness here because of the inconsistency. And that's where it's so important as Christians that we we maintain our Christian identity first and foremost over any political identity or national identity, because at the end right. of the day, how we treat people is going to be the way that they view Jesus Christ. And uh, yeah. and yeah. I, I, I totally appreciate what you said there. Yeah. Well, and and making putting putting a finer point on that. I have more in common with a with an Indian Christian that we don't speak the same language, watch the same shows, live in the same part of the world, et cetera, than I do with my white conservative atheist neighbor. Yeah, right. Right. Who's part um, of the, We have both, to keep Christ maybe, in maybe mind. Both similar to you. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Right. What's okay, the so next story, Scott? The last story also comes from India, but it's relating to Tibetan Buddhism. So here we also have another religion of peace, so to speak. When I think of the Dalai Lama, and you talk about the Dalai Lama in in popular culture, you know, he's the happy, he's the happy Buddhist, right? Should um, we, he, should we, yes, should, should we, should we give a parental advisory before we read this next headline? <laughs> yeah, you know, actually this is, this, yeah, it's probably appropriate to have a little bit of a, a trigger warning. Yeah, to those we'll, maybe we'll give you, a, we'll give you three seconds to tune out if you've got very small impressionable children. Three, two, one, hit us, Scott. Yeah, th- this story is is yes. sad, and uh, and and maybe Wicked. for those who who've been abused as children, you shouldn't listen to this one. But the Dalai Lama has apologized after a video emerged showing the spiritual leader kissing a child on the lips, and then asking him to quote suck my tongue at an event in northern India. 
In a statement Monday, the, the office for the Dalai Lama said he wishes to apologize to the boy and his family, as well as his many friends across the world, for the hurt his words may have caused, adding he regrets the incident. And then listen to this explanation. His holiness often teases people he meets in an innocent and playful way, even in public and before cameras. His apology comes after a video of the exchange, which took place during an event in the hillside city of Dharmasala in February, went viral on social media with many users criticizing the Dalai Lama's actions. And um, it goes on, it goes on to talk about that and and really tries to make an excuse for the Dalai Lama saying this is a cultural incident. And and I've been in some of those places and recognize like they're very different cultural uh, responses to things. I mean, the way that some cultures treat uh, sexuality, the way they treat what we would definitely call abuse uh, here is something very, very common in some of those situations. And, and I, you know, I, I, I don't know the whole story with the Dalai Lama. Certainly I'm not in a position to, to judge, but we would look at what happened here on its face and say, this is wholly inappropriate. And yet yeah. the West continues to put this person as like the pinnacle of holiness how should we respond to that? What, what yeah. do you think about the Dalai Lama in this response? Right, because nature abhors a vacuum. And in the West, we've discarded any concept of the transcendent. And so what do we do? We turn to Eastern traditions and we, we lionize figures like the Dalai Lama. And we almost, we almost fetishize Eastern spirituality because we've given up on Christendom, right? Yeah. So that, that shows our hypocrisy there. Things like pederasty are as old as time. Again, something else that's yeah. that's so common throughout pagan religion. It was common in the time mm-hmm. of the New Testament yeah. uh, among the, the Roman cults. Uh, it's, it's Christianity that expelled these things from the world. It's okay. why these things shock us when we hear them, but we shouldn't be shocked by them. We shouldn't let the amount to which we've been anesthetized against evil and human corruption uh, catch us off guard when we then go out into the world and we realize, and, and not that our culture is, is great. We're, we're doing awful. We've got uh-huh. plenty of grooming here, but right. you go out abroad and you realize that, that the gospel has not informed these societies and that the sensibilities are completely different and that these false religions ensnare and enslave people. Scott, I've got a question for you. Yeah. You used to lead a spiritual warfare workshop here, a training for our missionaries years ago. And he used to use a clip from some film that was about a, a, one of the Dalai yeah. Lamas. The, or, what, tell us about that because it really kind of pulls back the veil on yeah, these these religious systems. We should love the people that are caught up within them, but they are demonic at root. Martin Scorsese did a movie about the Dalai Lama in his early days called Kundun. And uh, it's a very interesting movie. and and really fits in line with what is described by others about Tibetan Buddhism. And I've been to some Tibetan Buddhist temples, not in Tibet per se, but in other parts of China. And uh, Tibetan Buddhism is a mixture of, of, of Indian Buddhism and the Bon religion, which is a shamanistic pagan Mm. religion. If you go to a, a, a Tibetan Buddhist temple, you'll see vivid images of demons. It's very more, it's a lot more similar to a Hindu temple, uh, really mm-hmm. in many ways than what you would expect within Buddhism. And so, you know, the Dalai Lama, one of the ways that they know that it's the Dalai Lama, because what they would believe about the Dalai Lama is that when he dies. And it, so this is true at this point. This, this is true. This isn't just the movie. Okay. No, but the movie captures it, I think, in a pretty, pretty appropriate and, and historically accurate way. So the Dalai Lama is considered enlightened. So he doesn't need to reincarnate, but he's choosing to be reincarnated as a living God to help people along the path to enlightenment for themselves. Um, That's kind of the Buddhist or or even the Hindu way of understanding these uh, religious figures. And so one of the ways, though, that the other priests know that it's the Dalai Lama that's, that's been reincarnated is there'll be signs that they'll be looking to, and usually they'll get some kind of a sign or a a word from a shaman and they will go to a village and they'll find a young child. And then what they will do is put out artifacts from the previous Dalai Lama's life. So they shows us really clearly in the movie. It's very fascinating, but there'll be like five pairs of reading glasses and six pens laying out and a few other little odds and ends. And they ask the boy, which ones are yours? And in the movie, they capture the young Dalai Lama, grabbing his glasses, grabbing his pen, 
grabbing his uh, whatever. And, and if he does it accurately, then they know that this is the spirit of the last Dalai Lama come to live in this, this child. Alex, what would you mm. make of that as a Christian? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, assuming it's actually happening, it's demonic. It's, it's clearly demonic. Right. So there's a two, op- two options, right? It's a, right. it's a farce, but I don't think it has to be a farce. I mean, we believe no. in demonic activity and there are... Well, how else would these religions gain a following apart from lying oh, signs real, and wonders, right? There's real power. And we see it in the scripture. Yeah. It's talked about often, you know, as there are, is a certain element of power that is gained by following after these false gods. And here we have this example. And so if, if we think that righteousness comes through Jesus Christ and righteousness comes, you know, that, that we learn righteousness by seeing God's laws and we are able to be righteous with an alien righteousness of Christ that's given to us to be able to follow and obey Jesus Christ, we've got to understand that these false gods and someone like the Dalai Lama, even though he may smile a lot and say very yeah. peaceful things, even though, you know, our our uh, spiritual athletes like Aaron Rodgers goes and sits at the feet of the Dalai Lama and other, you know, uh, famous uh, celebrities go and, and they honor the Dalai Lama because he's talking about peace, that can there really be a righteousness apart from God? And so should it shock us when we see a situation where you have a whole monastery full of of men, ungodly, unregenerate men and little boys that we would expect there to be evil things taking place. Now, mm-hmm. here, here, listen to this one response from a Western, uh, some of the Dalai Lama supporters. This is interesting. The expression of emotions and manners today has been melted together and become a, and become vividly westernized. <laughs> Namdo How's that for a La- first sentence? Lagyari, a Tibetan <laughs> activist in exile, wrote on Twitter. Bringing in narrative of other cultures, customs, and social influence on gender and sexuality to interpret Tibetan way of expression is heinous. So, and here it is, sticking out one's tongue as a sign of respect or agreement. It was often used as a greeting in traditional Tibetan culture. We're not, but here we're not talking about sticking out your tongue. We're talking about um, the Dalai Lama, you know, asking a little boy to suck his tongue. Right. Uh, that's a different thing. And, a little um, bit different. Yeah, I would just say just just a, a slightly just a different bit outside. thing. So, so what do you make of that response of like saying, oh, here you are importing your Western values onto a foreign situation? Now, this is, this is um, an English-speaking statement on behalf of Tibetan Buddhists to other English speakers in the media, essentially, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. See, to me, that signals that these groups know that at least for us here in the West, culture itself is an idol. It's as though they know that if they can attach something that's moral to this idea of culture or uh, a specific tradition or nationality, they know that if they can tie it to that, that it morally excuses it, right? They, because we do so idolize the idea of culture, we relative, relativize everything. Well, it's cultural, it's cultural. And it exposes, I think, the extent to which even missionaries can be caught up in that way of thinking. Yeah, sir, sure, some things are cultural. Some things are just plain moral as well. Right, right. And we ought not to confuse them. And we ought not to go along with secular philosophy and anthropology and saying, well, it's it's all just cultural. Well, it's really not. Some cultures, really all cultures, right? There's, uh-huh. There is nothing that's neutral. Everything is informed by the God that you worship Right, because culture is downstream from the cultus, uh, the religion, the, the right. reigning ideology. Whatever your God is, that will determine how it shapes your culture. So whether or not that's an accurate representation of what this would mean in the Dalai Lama's culture, right. uh, we have to be able to see through that ploy. Right. I mean, we we already see it happen where we read LGBTQ arguments for Greek culture and try to try to say, oh, what was happening with Spartans taking young boys out onto the battlefield with pederasty was, was just, was a beautiful cultural expression of, of, you know, homoeroticism, you know, and, and we would look at that from a Christian world, Christian perspective, a biblical perspective and say, oh yeah, yes, that happened, but that is also evil. Yeah. And the things that are happening in our culture that we're seeing happening, whether, whether they're being done by Christians or whether they're being done by people of other religions, like the Dalai Lama. We have to be able to use the same standard of the word of God 
and the righteousness of Christ and be able to say, no, this is evil. This is wrong and call it out. And so it's really important that we don't get sucked into, I like the way you said it, the, the idolatry of culture. No, the only God we, we follow is, is the triune God in the person of Jesus mm. Christ. To bring some of this to a close, Scott, I think with all of these stories in different ways, the best thing that we can do as mission-minded believers looking at the headlines is to look past them and realize that our battle is not with flesh and blood. It's with principalities and powers. It's not just with ideas and isms. Yeah, a lot of it manifests as wrestling with ideas and isms, and we have to take all of those thoughts captive to obey Christ, too. That's also true. But what stands behind those isms is dark forces, personal yeah. evil, spiritual authorities in high places, low places, uh -huh. uh, everything that Ephesians 6 tells us about the nature of this cosmic battle. Uh -huh. uh, the worst thing that I think we could do is approach all of these things that are cultural, that are political, that have to do with, okay, how can a missionary get in and be effective in a new cultural context? Worst thing that we could do is approach those issues dispassionately as mere issues of policy or of differences of opinion. This is spiritual battle. And it's interesting, you know, as you read Ezekiel, as you read Daniel, just in my Bible reading right now, I'm in Revelation. Uh, same thing as as you just mentioned in, he, in Ephesians. It, it's clear that while Okay, the cultures are warring and while there's yeah. things happening amongst real geopolitical forces that there is a spiritual power behind those things and yeah. we see the evidences of them don't change a whole lot you know where where god is calling out the pagan nations for or calling out the the hebrew nation for their mirroring of the canaanite nations and mirroring of of the um mesopotamian religions of of devouring children and destroying children, offering them up to the fire. God calls those nations out, and yet we still see the same perversions in our world today. And it it's the manifestation of these false gods, these demonic influences that are still preying upon the peoples of this world. And the only solution is uh, the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, which thankfully God in his mercy continues to extend the the greatest news the world has ever heard that there can be redemption. There can be a, a foreign alien righteousness applied to you and you can be mm -hmm. saved. And that, that should give our missionaries and our pastors and our, our lay people in the communities watching this world just seems to kind of come undone. Give them a confidence that God is still working and he's still saving people. Mm -hmm. And he's he, the same power that was at work in Daniel's day and the same power that was at work in John the Re Revelator day is still at work today. Mm -hmm and uh, the same Holy Spirit's at work in our lives. Well, we want to know what you think. Thank you for being a part of the show today. If you're watching or if you're listening, if there's a news story that you'd like to hear us discuss, go ahead and send us a link. You can email alex at missionspodcast.com or scott at scott at missionspodcast.com. Of course, remember that the Missions Podcast is a ministry of ABWE. But before we go, we want to let you know that there is still time to enter the giveaway for Radius Missiology Conference 2023 happening June 28th and 29th in Sun Valley, California. If you want to enter that giveaway, go to our website, missionspodcast.com, and hit the Radius giveaway up there at the top. You can also click the link that's in the show notes or type in missionspodcast.com slash RMC23. We're giving away 10 free tickets. We hope to see you there as we're doing some live recordings, talking to some important guests about topics on contextualization, topics of honor and shame are all going to come up at this important conference, and we look forward to seeing you there. The Missions Podcast is a ministry of ABWE, and you can get more content at missionspodcast.com or learn more about ABWE at abwe.org. We, we appreciate your support, and you can go to the website and hit the support tab at the top as well if you'd like to be a part of what we're doing but the best way to spread the love is to hit subscribe and to share the show with a friend and leave us a positive rating and review in your podcast platform of choice that'll help others discover it well until next week thank you for joining us 